station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. John F. Kennedy, Presidential Library. This is Houston. Please call the International Space Station for a voice check. Station, this is Tom Putnam at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library. How do you hear me? We've got you loud and clear here on the International Space Station. How do you hear us? We hear you fine, and Sonny, you spoke here once before, and we're so happy to have you back, but this time from space. Well, it's great to be back with you guys. Um, you're in a beautiful location, a place I call home. Um, but this is also uh, my second home, so I can't uh, say the, the view is bad from up here either. And Joe, we welcome you to the Kennedy Library. Thank you so much for participating in this program. It's my pleasure, and I'm happy to be with you all today, and welcome aboard the International Space Station. So we'll go to question number one. Okay, uh, SUNY, from Nina Mass, the home of athletes and astronauts. Were you aware growing up in Massachusetts that it was President Kennedy who set the goal for this country to be the first to land on the moon? Was he an inspiration for you? Absolutely, and it wasn't just because of the accent. I think uh, his speech in Houston, which is uh, anniversaries coming up in September, uh, laid the pathway for us to put people on the moon. Pretty ambitious goal, pretty amazing that we were able to do it, and we've done it successfully a number of times after that, and uh, that was all because of uh, JFK's speech and his inspiration to the country. So um, I, we are now in, you know, stepping onto the next path, and hopefully uh, human beings will be following in Curiosity's tracks before too long, um, but JFK definitely was the, the person who paved the way. Thank you. Joe, when you're up in the space station, how do you know when it's daytime versus nighttime, and how do you know when to go to sleep? That's a great question. Uh, if we didn't have any windows on the space station, we wouldn't know if it was day or night. So it takes us about an hour and a half to go around the Earth, and so we'll have about 45 minutes of daylight and then 45 minutes of night. And we have a uh, schedule that shows us when it's dark and when it's light outside. And of course, we do have some windows so we can look outside and see when that happens. And we follow a schedule and we're on what's called GMT time, which is the time in uh, London, England. And so we go to bed at around 9.30 GMT time. So we go to bed around 9.30 and get up at 6 a.m. Thank you. Why can't you take your dog, Gorby, with you to the space station? Well, I really wish I could. I miss him like crazy, and I miss him probably because uh, he represents those cool things on Earth that you don't have up here, like wind in your face and walking on the beach, because that's what I usually do with him. So, as a replacement, I go to the cupola and look outside and see a lot of beautiful places, plus sunrise and sunset, 16 times a day, like Joe was talking about. And uh, a friend of mine made me a little stuffed Gorby, so I have him up here to hang out with me. So uh, that's sort of good enough for now, until I get home in November. Good morning, Joe. What's the most amazing and the unique thing you've seen out the window while in space? Good morning to you. Um, it's really pretty cool looking out the window. We have the cupola, which gives us a fantastic view of the Earth. So a couple of things that I've seen that have really impressed me. Uh, it's been when we've had these visiting vehicles, the Dragon and HTV. It's pretty neat to see a vehicle that we have made come up to the International Space Station. But then naturally, uh, just uh, about a month ago before Sonny and Aki arrived, the southern lights, the auroras, were just uh, 
in full bloom. We had some solar activity a few days previous, and it was just an incredible light show. And I tried to take some pictures, but they just don't capture what I really saw, and it was absolutely incredible. Sunny, when you go on the spacewalk on August 30th to replace one of the electrical units, how long will it take? And is it easy to fix, or is it nerve-wracking? It's a good question because, yeah, every time you go what we call outside, it is a little nerve-wracking. Um, we have a suit sort of the similar size to Robonaut that you see in front of us right here that Aki and I will be wearing to go replace this unit. Aki will actually be doing most of the work. I'm just unbolting part of it, and he's going to fly it with the be in the ro in the on the robotic arm, which Joe is actually going to fly to move the big piece, which is actually also about as big as Ro Robonaut, the box, from one part of the space station, sort of like a tool belt on the space station, to where that box needs to be changed out. Um, so I'll be sort of running around, we call it a spacewalk, but actually you sort of use your hands hand over hand on handrails outside. I'll be doing that, uh, doing running some elect other electrical cables and then helping Aki out. So just to, to get back to your question, yeah, it is a little nerve-wracking when you're out there because um, we're, me and Aki will rely on each other. Uh, if something happens to one of us, the other guy has to save the other guy and bring them back into the airlock and get us back in safely. Uh, the EMU, the space suit, is essentially its own little spacecraft, so all of the pieces and parts of it have, have to work also. And so we've checked it out to make sure it's, it's working well before we go out, but you never know what's going to happen. So it's a little nerve-wracking. It'll take the whole space walk will probably take about six hours um, so it's going to be a long day for us um, we eat a good breakfast before we go and we'll be hungry when we get back in thank you both god bless you this is for joe how does your eating change in space compared to earth and do you need fewer calories in a microgravity environment That's a great question, and just a few minutes ago, we were taking some mass measurements to see how our, up here we have to measure mass because we're in microgravity, but we want to see how our weight has changed since we've been up here. And for me personally, it's been interesting because I've noticed that I've started to eat more after being here for about two months. So it took my body maybe a little bit longer than other people to get used to being in this environment. Um, you know, I'm not sure if we need more or less calories. As we calculate our calories, we use the amount that we need on Earth. Um, even though we're not walking all the time, we are working out at least a couple of hours every day. So that does take quite a few calories. Um, so your, your eating habits do change a little bit, but after a while the body does adjust, and I think I'm right now about back to normal. But I do look forward to getting home and having a good fat cheeseburger. I'm from um, Norwalk, Connecticut, West Rock Middle School, and this one's for Sunny. Can you explain exercises that you do on the space station to stay physically fit? Yeah, like Joe was talking about, we work out probably about two hours a day. We've got a, a couple different exercise pieces of equipment that help you know, our cardiovascular as well as our strength and conditioning. So we have a bicycle right here, which is right in front of Robonaut. Um, maybe you can see it. It doesn't have a seat. You don't need to sit down up here in space. All you do is click your pedals in, your feet in the pedals, and, and start to ride. Um, we also have a treadmill, which to run in space, you have to have a harness on which is sort of connected by bungees to hold you down on the treadmill. And then thirdly, we have an, a resistive exercise device, which is based on um, using vacuum to create a load. And it's just like you're lifting in a gym with a bar to do squats and deadlifts. And all of that is required because we lose we obviously start losing muscle mass and bone mass as soon as we get up here because we don't have to fight against gravity. So with those three exercises, we're able to exercise, or those pe three pieces of equipment, we're able to exercise our cardiovascular system and then work on our bone density and our muscle mass. Uh, this is for both of you, and can you show us how you do a flip? Ooh, let's see if we can do that. <laughs> oh, 
I got stuck. <laughs> there you go. Joe, what do you do for fun on the ISS? We do a lot of flips for fun because we can, so that's pretty cool. Uh, floating in space, you never get tired of that. Every morning when I wake up and I float out of my little sleep station, I'm pretty excited about doing that. Uh, but again, looking out the window is a view like you can't get anywhere else. So uh, looking out the window is something else that I really enjoy doing. And when I get back home, I won't have that. So I'm enjoying every moment of it. Uh, we're also able to uh, watch some movies, a little TV. So a lot of the things that you do at home, we can do up here. We just do it in a little bit different location. For Sunny, has the ISS been hit by any debris? And how do you monitor and repair damage to the ISS? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was a little surprised. We've been hit by a couple more things than I had imagined, and I just found that out just recently, um, just when we were preparing for our spacewalk. One of the things they sent us up are photos, detailed photos of all over the space station uh, where the space station has been hit by little micrometeorites. And it's pretty interesting. They're going really fast, and so when they hit the space station, a part of the metal, it makes like a little crater as though, you know, like just like we have craters on Earth, like if a meteorite hits the earth it makes a little crater and it has little rigid edges on the side and that's what we have to be worried about when we're doing a spacewalk so we don't cut our gloves on some of these little craters so it's been hit quite a few times but they've all been pretty little um, if we got hit by something big that actually penetrated the space station then we'd have to do an emergency procedure and then maybe do a repair from the inside to prevent anything bad from happening um, but the little ones are okay. Uh, the big ones we avoid because the ground and a lot of people on Earth track the big stuff outside and make sure the space station is not going to get hit by anything big. Yo, how do you do your laundry? <laughs> yeah, Sonny's smelling me. I'm not sure how I smell, but one of the many, we have a lot of great things about being up here. But one of the nice things is I don't have to do laundry. We don't do laundry. Um, so we'll wear our clothes for uh, you know a few days, depending on which uh, uh, piece of clothing. I think I've had these pants on for maybe a month and a half now. But uh, when we feel like they're dirty, we just go ahead and we throw them away. So we don't have to do laundry. And so it's kind of nice. Why did, you, why did you choose to be an astronaut? Well, for me, it was a little bit of happenstance. Um, you know, I was a helicopter pilot before I became an astronaut. Uh, you know, I thought all the people who are astronauts are uh, really smart and, you know, way you know too clever for me. Um, but I went to test pilot school, and when I was there, we had the opportunity to come go down to Johnson Space Center. And it's the first time I ever met an astronaut, and I met a guy na by the name of John Young. And he talked about landing vertically on the moon. And it sounded a whole lot like, like helicopter flying. So I thought, wow, you know, maybe I have the same type of skills that these people have. And so I started looking at uh, the application process and what I had to do. And then I went and got my master's, and uh, then that's how I became an astronaut. But before that, I never even imagined it. So um, my one advice to all you guys out there, if you're thinking about this and thinking about you know, flying on a, uh, a rocket to you know, up to the station or over to Mars, um, you, your dreams can come true. Just do, do the best that you can at what you like, and somehow it seems to all line up and uh, fall into place, and you'll become what you want to become. Joe, what do you have to do to become an astronaut? That's a, that's a tough question, and like Sonny said, um, Astronauts come from all different backgrounds. She was a uh, helicopter pilot. My background's in geology, and I was actually a school teacher before I was selected to become an astronaut. So like Sonny said, do what you really enjoy doing, and then you'll, you'll excel at it, and you'll do a great job. But all of us do have a background in the sciences, 
technology, engineering, or mathematics. So that is a requirement that you have to have. But after you have that, those basic, uh, those basic understandings, then after that, do whatever you want to do. And we're a very di a diverse group, and that's what makes the astronaut corps special: is that we have these different backgrounds, and we all work together. So do what you like to do, but you do got to study hard in school and enjoy the sciences and math. Uh, just questions for Sonny. Um, you've sort of answered this already, but did your military career help you prepare for the astronaut program? And what advice would you give someone interested in becoming an astronaut? And I know you did some deep sea um, adventures and whether that helps with your space station experience. Yeah, I would absolutely say for sure. Like Joe said, we have people who are, you know, teachers, military pilots, doctors, veterinarians, engineers, biochemists, uh, physicists in the office. So we've got a really big background. We're definitely not all military. There's a, there is a group of military people. And I think um, from having responsibility at a, at a pretty young age, flying a helicopter and being a, a helicopter commander at like 24 years old, gives you a little bit of an idea of some of the responsibilities you have when you come live and work on a space station or are part of a, a, a crew on a Soyuz or a, a space shuttle or whatever the next vehicle is going to be. Um, there is a lot of responsibility. You, you learn about um, how to handle stress also. Uh, so you're put in some situations that you haven't planned for, uh, but you have a lot of training in your background and you know how to handle it. So I think from my military background, a lot of that came through, as well as uh, teamwork, leadership and followership. You know, we're, we're a team up here. It's, there's six of us on the station, but there's also, you know, hundreds and actually thousands of people on the ground all over the world that we work with, and you have to realize that you're part of a team. Um, everything that gets done up here is, is not just because of our individual efforts. It's because of everybody, the planning and the group that puts it all together. And so you have to recognize that and understand that and understand what the other team members are, are dealing with. And I think all of that came from my military background. Um, just specifically from the diver part of it also, it's really parallel to doing a spacewalk. You know, when I was doing a little deep sea diving for a while and the suits are the same, you go into an environment that's not really uh, hospitable to human life, and you, but you get used to it and you understand um, where the dangers are and you know how to take the risks, the calculated risks that you need to take to get the, the jobs done. So um, if anybody's interested in going to, into the military, I would highly recommend it because it gives you really uh, a good background on a whole bunch of different things. Joe also was in the military for a while too and uh, I think um, it, it is just a, a great way uh, to learn a lot of uh, vocational skills, technical skills, leadership, followership and uh, you know it's a great opportunity. Um, Joe, what do you do if someone gets really sick on the space station? Yeah, we, uh, we go through a lot of training in Houston on some of the basic medical uh, ways to treat people and if we do have any accidents, what we can do up here. And one thing we're very fortunate, like Sonny said, we're part of a big team. So if somebody were to get sick, we have flight surgeons uh, on the ground that can help us. Uh, we do have medication up here that we can take. We have all the equipment we need if someone were to get a cut or something were to happen. So we're very well trained. We have a lot of support on the ground. And if anything really, really bad happened, we do have our Soyuz vehicle here. And we could get back to Earth pretty quickly if we have to. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you.